Okay. Let people join in. Got Rich. How are you doing, Rich? We got Leslie House. How are you doing, Leslie? Just going to give a uh, couple minutes for people to filter in it and we'll get uh we'll get the interview going thank you rich leslie i'm good we're hanging in uh you know Staying safe, washing hands. Fortunately, not able to go outside as much as I would like to, but hopefully we will soon be over this insane quarantine and time. I'll play my party. Maybe rich. Not until quarantine's done, that's for sure. A pandemic. Yeah, it was raining here last night, Leslie. The mix of the uh, the poor weather and the fact that we are not able to do very much is uh, starting to wear down on all of us, including my bandmates. Okay, I'm just about ready. Well, today I get to interview not only a friend of mine, but a very good friend of the bands, um, Sterling Campbell, who is a mentor of mine. And I cherish our friendship because honestly, he's taught me so, so much about not only drums, but the industry and uh, you know his role as a studio drummer, a touring musician, I mean, it, it's, you know, you could go on and on about how much he's done in his career. That's not over yet. It's continuing to go and thrive. Um, so hopefully, once we get him on, we'll be able to share some great stories of his, some tips. If you guys have questions, feel free to write in the chat. I'll, you know, I'll be paying attention to it um, as frequently as I can. Oh, we got Zach in the house. Who else we got here? There we go, getting some people in. What's going on here? We got Chris too. Hope everyone's being safe and well. So I will do my best guys. This is not my forte. There's a reason I play drums relatively shy. I like having stuff in front of me. So being this close to everyone and right focused on the camera, not gonna lie, it's a little intimidating. How you doing, Kim? Miss everybody, miss playing live. Sterling should be joining us very shortly. <laughs> I 
Thank you, Mr. Jackson. I don't know if you guys saw yesterday, we had, uh, oh, 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 who do we got here? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. Might be on yours. Check, there's gonna be a, a tab in the corner. I can't hear you. It's gonna be a tab in the corner, Sterling. Let me give him a text. You are muted by host, you're an unmuted by host. Hello? You know what, hold up for one second. Okay. Just two drummers. <laughs> oh, Chris. There it goes. You got me, bud? Yep. Oh, yes. We go, my good friend Sterling, and a good friend of the bands. I miss him dearly. How are you holding up, Sterling, during this time? I'm good. You know, I go for walks in the park. I'm right by Riverside, so that's good. Taking care of my mom. That's the hardest part because she's got some back problems, and I can't take her to the hospital. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a, this world we live in at the moment. A little, a little crazier than I'm prepared for, that's for sure. A little crazy for our profession as well, considering uh, touring is pretty much on hold for a little bit. That won't be very good <laughs> to see. You know, as, as we go on, hopefully it, it gets better and not worse. So, Sterling. Yeah. Are, who would have thought? You and I. Flat screen <laughs> dreams. Yeah, there we go. So I was hoping we could start just a little bit. Um, if you could explain how you got into music and what it was like growing up in New York City during the time you were growing up in the 70s and 60s. I come from a musical, non-music playing family. Yeah. All I, you know, I come from a family of six boys and my mom and dad. And my mother was a big music lover. My father was a big music lover. And my brothers were big music lovers. And my brothers were like, you know, when I became cognitive of music and they were always uh, bringing in all new records yeah. that I could relate to. Like my mother was still into like the older stuff, Ella Fitzgerald and my father was into like Ray Charles. I mean, which I got into later, but at the time I was into stuff <laughs> so, like Stevie Wonder. And, yeah, that's freaking um, awesome. Man. And like, like you said, so none of your other brothers, were they musicians or were they just into music? They were just into music. Oh, that's freaking, I mean, I, cause, you know, growing up how I did, I had drums accessible and you did not, which is like, you know, I'm so blessed. But the fact that you didn't grow up with having as accessible, uh, you, didn't, you weren't as accessible to instruments. You didn't have your first drum kit until mm -hmm. later. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what you would do to kind of get that itch or cure the itch that you had for music um, before you had any instruments? Well, in the beginning, it was just purely just the love of music, like a music consumer. Yeah. Because the music was so potent at the time. Um, I think I really became like, I came became aware of it like, during the period with Stevie Wonder, mm -hmm. um, when he was on just like, he was winning album of the year almost every year. Um, and it was an interesting thing because it was the one thing that bridged, even though my mother being a couple of generations away, we all listened to the same thing. Yeah. It was a period where music was happening when even stuff that was coming on the radio, my mother and I would, technically go to a Stevie Wonder concert together. See, that's, that's you know? so cool. 
I remember hearing yeah, that's that's a that's a 40 that's like a 40 year gap almost a 40 year gap between me and my mom yeah and um but music was just so good at that at that time and my brothers were very open-minded about music so you know we weren't just listening to like a particular genre of music um they turned me on to bands like chicago mm -hmm. and Elton john and and it just happened to be at the time where they were at their apex, you know, where they were just on fire. Every record was just like amazing. So, you know, I couldn't really play the records at Hausa, but I was always, you know, the music was loud enough, even if my brothers had the door closed, you know, where like, you know, it was just that longing. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't old, old enough at a point to own a record player or I had money to buy records. So everything was done through listening through my family. And um, I mean, it was just a strong presence of music and good music at that. You were my mother loved, my mother loved, like I said, all the classics. My father loved like Ray Charles and all the kind of like, you know, the standard pop singers, Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra, something yeah. like that. But my, my brothers had all the newer stuff. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. You remember what was a, I don't want to say an a, like an apex, but what was like the first thing you heard that made you want to play drums? It was probably it was a, a, probably a couple of things. It was definitely Stevie Stevie Wonder. It was definitely Elton John and Chicago, especially like Chicago, like that that it really featured the drums. The drums are really featured, big gigantic drum fills. Yeah going into the chorus, like these big tom fills. I mean, so it was always just, I mean, just the way they, just the way the, the drums set up the songs, how, how uh, Nigel Olsen played. And, you know, Elton, like I said, that was like a totally different thing. Like nobody in my neighborhood was listening to that. You know, Goodbye you, Yellow Brook Road and- You grew up on the Upper West Side and you still live on the- Upper well, I, well, I grew up in, in Washington Heights first, which okay. is 164th Street. And then we moved down to uh, like late 70s, 77, we moved to the Upper West Side. That's so crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So when you got um, your first drum kit, how old were you, by the way? When you, what was your first drum kit? What I was about 12 or 13, my mother. One day I showed up, I, what happened was, you know, I was into the music and I, and I mean, I loved all the instruments, but for some reason I just started, you know, Growing up in New York, I mean, we lived on blocks and everybody knew everybody in the block. That's yeah. how it was, you know. You knew everybody in the building, you knew everybody in the block. And there wasn't a lot of things that like we have now with computers and everything. So you kind of had to make up your own thing. Yeah. For some reason, I started like, you know, just banging on cars. We would sit on the cars outside and I would play a drum beat on the car and it became like almost like a thing. Oh. And I guess my mom picked up on it. And then one Christmas I woke, I woke up and there was a drum kit under the tree. And um, it was kind of messed up so because obviously they make a lot of noise. And my mother like got my brother to take me out of the house for the day. Oh, no. You couldn't even play it. No, which might've been a good thing because maybe there was just, maybe there was just a lifelong you, um were you expecting to get a drum kit or was it a total shock? It's a total shock. Oh my God. I don't even remember like saying, mommy, mommy, please give me a drum. I don't even know. If I, I don't, I have to ask her that. I don't even know. That's so incredible. Did she just pick up on it or did I ask for it? I'm not even sure if I asked for it or not. Yeah. Do you remember what, what uh, brand of drums they were? Oh, Telestar. I think that was the name of the company, Telestar. It was like a Japanese, like cheap. Yeah, but they work. Just, but they sound good. There we go. <laughs> In hindsight. Do huh? Do you still have them by any chance? No. <sighs> no. What I, would do I don't is... have anything from my past. I wish I did. You know, I used to have some cool drum kits. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't you have do still have some cool GMS kits at the studio. Yeah. I mean, more recently, but yeah. not like, you know. From back then. Well, not like the baby socks of drunk kids. <laughs> oh, look at these little. Look at these things. 
Well, so circle, circling back to, you know, growing up in New York City and being on the block and knowing everyone in the building and in the streets and on the block and in your neighborhood. Um, I remember you telling me a story that I think people will find very interesting if they don't already know. Um, but if you could shed light on when you ran into someone in the lobby of your building just after, you know, I think you said you had been playing drums for only a short amount of time. You bumped into someone. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got the bug for drumming after I got the drum kit, obviously. And, you know, you know I didn't know what level, but I, I, I wanted to play drums. I was very interested because mm -hmm. I was still very interested in just music in general. Yeah. And we moved from 164th Street down to 101st and 77. And the next year, that following year, I mean, it was amazing. My building on which I'm living in now, mm -hmm. this apartment building had about five or six drummers Oof. who practiced Loud in building. the building, <laughs> which, was, which was kind of amazing because for some reason, I mean, I would never get people like, shut that noise up, never. Yeah. And there was four other guys who would play drums in the building. So there was something about this neighborhood too, because it, it just, there was a lot of artists around here mm -hmm. and a lot of famous even, there was one, I think on 100th Street, 100th Street, I think at one point like Max Roach and, and uh, Elvin Jones lived in the same building like on Central Park West. But there was a lot of jazz musicians around here. And just the, the area was a very artistic area, like the Upper West Side, because Miles lived on 72nd or 79th or something, Ron Carter, bass player. I mean, just tons of people. So I'm getting back to the story. 78, Dennis Davis moves into my building, who was David Bowie's drummer. And he had a show at the Garden, and I just happened to be in the lobby at the same time as he's about to walk out, because I see him with a drumstick bag and uh, a simple case, and you know my eyes light up, like you know, because I, I had just kind of met him, yeah, that that day, and he's like, and he's like, hey, where you? And I just like you know, I was just like a little inquisitive kid. Hey, where you going? Oh my god, where you going? He says, I got a show tonight at Madison Madison Square Garden with David Bowie, and I mean I. I think it's important to paint the picture of what Madison Square, to play Madison Square Garden back in the 70s. You had to be Elton John. Yeah. You had to be Led Zeppelin. You had to be the Rolling Stones, you know? And I saw Elton John uh, 1976 at Madison Square Garden. I mean, you know, and it's, it's that was my Avengers. <laughs> that was my superheroes, man. You know, the musicians were like superheroes and it was like larger than life. And I just looked at it as a larger than life thing. So the idea of seeing a, an artist that I liked, especially at Madison Square Garden, but on top of it, now Dennis goes to me and says, here's a ticket. Oh my gosh. Which orchestral seat, $19. That is so ridiculous. David Bowie, 1978 tour which was the Heroes Tour. One and I, it was the first concert I ever went to by myself. Oh my God. How old would you have been then? In 1978, uh, you said? Yeah, uh, 14. Oh my gosh. That, what a, <laughs> and the, it's like crazy. The, the thing that's so incredible about that story, which again, people may or may not know, is the fact that you later became David Bowie's drummer for over a decade played with them, hung out with them. And it's like, I remember you telling me that story and it is just, it's like a fairy tale. It's on, it's almost unbelievable how it worked out. And then later in life. Well, the thing that's even more know. amazing about it, you know, I, um, my friend, Zach Alford, we went to, um, well, we didn't go to school together, but we became friends. Yeah. And, you know, I was telling him about Dennis and we went up to his house and Zach also became the drummer of David Bowie. Oh, and there was another drummer named Poojie Bell who I met up at Dennis's house. Yeah. Who also played on some of David's work. Oh my God. Black Tie White Man as well. 
it's a, it's a small world, Sterling. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty. So there's this weird Upper West Side. Like everyone knows. Thing with David. With drummers. Oh, that's so crazy. I, I, he liked Upper West Side drummers. <laughs> he liked the Upper West Side drummers. He exclusively went with Upper, side, upper West Side drummers. So where are we at now? You meet Dennis Davis. You see David Bowie. Is that like a definitive moment of like, okay, here we go. Like, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I talked about this, like I, I wrote about this, but honestly, if I can just like, when I, it's like going to see when I first saw Star Wars. Yeah. And probably everybody else. And there's people still dressing up as Princess Leia. <laughs> still, still to this day. You know, and that's what it was like. I went to go see Star Wars. I went in to Master Square Garden. And when I came out, I'm looking into the sky because anything was possible. That's what they did. I got from it. Plus, once again, I knew the drama. So my excitement level, like I couldn't wait to like, you know, go up to his house or be invited up to, to Dennis's house because he would have a lot of musicians around and I just wanted to be around music. And <clears throat> also that tour, I'm sure probably other people who saw that tour really set the standard for what the 80s was gonna be. I mean, the way he, it looked completely futuristic there's nothing that looked like that at the time. And it's David like, was a very forward thinking person, you know? So he was at the height of his game because on that tour, he was doing all, he was doing mostly Heroes, the album Low, Ziggy. I mean, he was covering everything up to So it was, the, the, the set list was insane. Oh, and that's and probably my, you know, I mean, the band was Adrian Ballou on guitar, Dennis, George Murray, Carlos Salomar. I mean, the, the Bowie aficionados know. I mean, these are, the, you know, the, especially Dennis, Carlos, and George Murray. They were with David. Technically, I mean, Dennis played on, and Dennis and Carlos played on Young Americans of the Scary Monsters. So yeah. it, was, it was basically Dave, David Bowie and the Spiders from Harlem. <laughs> the Spiders from Harlem. Because it was a freaking, it was a black band. Yeah. It was a band, you know, it was like, and it's so crazy because it, what that influence did for everybody else, those guys were a part of that. They, they, they contributed greatly to David's sound. It's, it's, and uh, um, they, they weren't alternative or they weren't new wave or new romantic. They were just, you know, some cats from New York. <laughs> It's so awesome. I it's feel like, amazing. yeah, like, after that show, like, how did you even sleep? Because it, you know, like, it's, like you said, show setting up what the 80s was going to be like, and it, it was like watching Star Wars for the first time, super futuristic, and I'm sure a hell of a show. Like and, I said, people are still dressing up as Princess Leia. I mean, I'm still <laughs> technically, that's what it is. I'm still dressing up <laughs> after that more just from the music in general, but like that, I mean, like I said, I was listening to some of the most potent music of popular music at that time and reached, I mean, everybody was, like when I was coming up, everybody was on the top of their game. Paul yeah. Simon, Stevie Wonder, there was the Philly sound. There was like the post, hold on for one second because my mother's gonna come. Hey mom, I'm doing, I'm doing an interview right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mom, can we? She can see it on YouTube, right? I'll try to set it up for you. Oh, no. I'm, I'm doing it right now. It's live. Okay. I'll I'll try to set it up for you right now. Anyway. <laughs> so okay. good. Where do I do? How do I get on it? If you just go to YouTube and go to the temp, type in Tempt Band on YouTube. It, it's on our channel. It'll be live. And that's going to be posted as well. Okay. I tried to set this up on my mind. I wasn't thinking. Um, anyway, I don't is it going to be still playing? Can I play it back? Or is it just. Yeah, you'll, it'll be posted, um, I think, hopefully. I'll do that. It'll be in or in all, but it yeah. will be online. We'll yeah. be able to watch. So, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. Where, where, where were we? Sorry. So we were just finishing up with the 78, seeing Bowie, having that. Yeah. 
So like- yeah, so from there on in, it was just like, the, like I said, everybody was in this, like when I was growing up and all that stuff, there was the Philly sound, it was Paul Simon was on fire, you name it, the R&B was on another level. Yeah. Ohio players, I mean, you can just, the parliament, you can just go down the list. It was incredible, you know? So, so great. David thing kind of like, it felt like it just took everything. Yeah. It took every, I went in there and it's like, what, what? You know, it just expanded everything that I've already like knew about and it expanded it even further, you know? Um, oh gosh. Cause you, you got Adrian Blue, this is kind of atonal stuff. You got this R&B thing, you got this uh, real European thoughts going through David and ambient music, everything. He opens up with an ambient piece in 1978. <laughs> who did that yeah it's not i feel like that would have been a shock he awful. opens the show like basically yeah i think i forgot which uh one saw one you know and it's like that's how he starts the show and i was like you know jaw dropped and just blown away and just the set design and everything it looked like freaking star wars that's so like something out of a, you know it's like a kubrick you know did the set or something <laughs> and the music Gosh, but anyway, man. so yeah, that was a huge for somebody didn't I only knew fame. Yeah. I wasn't like technically a Bowie fan. I just knew fame. So when I you know, when I came I was like, oh man, that's it. Yeah, you got some stuff. I'm going to play I'm going to be a drummer. Yeah. And Dennis was amazing. Dennis I, He's bad. He's a Oh, he's man. A bad he's so drummer. inventive. So inventive, man. Like I mean, cuz I would I you know, over the years, I asked him about that stuff, and it's funny because he he basically didn't know what David was talking about. <laughs> or Brian was, you know, they were doing all these like you know little experiments, experiments, and he's like, I don't know what it was, but I liked it, and I just kind of went along with it. And, That's so uh, wild, so so wild. Yeah. I think this is so, a good segue to get into some the of the incredible people you've played with, starting with the '80s, and you, so you. And where'd you go to high school? Because you... I went to, I mean, listen, I'm like, my. I'm, all I thought all about was music. Music, yeah. music, music. So I guess I should go to a music yeah. high school, you know? I didn't really know about the high school, but it was a music high school, and that's yeah. what I wanted to do, so it made sense. And I auditioned, and I, you know, I didn't know anything from a scholastic point of view i just wanted to play drums to be honest with you as as uh, I, I, well. <laughs> what are these notes <laughs> but no in hindsight i wish i would have i could have you know i wish i would have paid more attention to it but it was so you get into the 80s and all all, all of a sudden music changes too you know mm-hmm. it's not bell bottom rock anymore and it's like coming out of a disco thing it's coming out of the post punk thing and there's a whole like New York aesthetic that's happening at the time. You know, hip hop is starting to take off. So when I went to music and art, it was the first, I was introduced to downtown. Yeah. I never really hung out downtown and downtown was downtown. And it was, re- it was radically different from anywhere else of growing up in the neighborhood, you know? Yeah. So when I got into music and art, it was, it was an amazing experience too, mainly from the people I went to school with. First of all, there was musicians. So they're very like-minded. Yeah. You know, you talked about music, you, you hang outside. I was more interested in hanging outside and talk about music and almost like trading card of music. Yeah. Um, and also it, a lot of people from around different parts of New York went to the school. It was, it was set up for artists and, you know, so you had a pretty much art related thing. And um, I took a, one of the drummers got called to audition who is, he was more like in his late thirties and forties. And he got, he got asked if he would be interest, interested in joining a punk band. And he was like, that's totally out of my league, but I might know somebody. And uh, it was this band called The Pedantics. The Pedantics. Yes. And that was like technically my first band. And everything took place downtown. So we're playing all of the downtown 
haunts. The Ritz, which is now, um, I forgot what the Webster Hall, mm -hmm. Peppermint Lounge, everything. I mean, it was just, New York really had an incredible music scene back at that time. And all the new bands from England and all the new bands in general were coming through New York. And we were, we were one of those bands that got to open up for a lot of these bands. So we yeah. opened up for Echo and the Bunny Men and Jamaladeen Takuma. I mean, if you look up these names and, I mean, even we were even doing shows with the Beastie Boys when they were a punk band. I was in another band called Urban Blight where Urban Blight was bigger than the Beastie Boys. Oh my gosh. So they were opening up. <laughs> Urban Blight was like a ska funk. That was another amazing band that I, I was in, involved with, were really great. And um, like I said, all these bands were playing. So we opened up for Susie and the band. She's like, all these bands coming from England, all the new New York bands. Um, so there was a lot going on. Yeah. And, and um, hip hop and, 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 and break dancing and all that stuff was all starting to happen at the same time downtown. So there was never a dull moment oh you know? and everything and everything you see right now was definitely that in in that mixture at that period of time and a lot of stuff you're seeing from from club the club scene obviously there was studio 54 back in the late 70s but like it got deeper and deeper as yeah. the 80s went and people got more inventive of what the clubs were like and the music that we play so I can't even imagine. And yeah, you were just a magnet on, you know, just, you got to see a lot of things. Yeah. Got to see a lot of people kind of grow and progress. I mean, Living Color, um, you know, like I said, the Beastie Boys, Madonna was doing, like we were in the music building and Madonna was in the music building. That's, that should be a Netflix movie. In yeah, Netflix. in itself, the music building. The in music the building. <laughs> oh my gosh. That place for the trip so freaking incredible so but yeah so i cut my teeth yeah in that environment and i was playing with a lot of different people too on the side you know so i got to play with this band called the special jellies which was like this noise rock band i had no idea what that was i know how, i didn't know what even punk was I, or i didn't even know what it meant i just knew it was faster than what i've been playing yeah it was just it was more like kind of really naive things and there was great singer songwriters there was like funk thing there was reggae things there was and like I said there was a lot of people I mean there was people like I, I met people who were in the Marley camp who were the son of the kids from the the whalers and oh my lord I went to high school with Gil Evans kids Miles Evans and Noah Evans and so the, I would go down in the house and there's this it was Gil Evans and it was like what? I didn't even know it at the time yeah but I knew he was famous and I knew he you know worked with Miles I didn't really know it in depth but he was there you know oh my god and I went to school with Ron Carter's kids and so there was a like a wealth of stuff and all it was just enough to be around it and I didn't have to like even like completely soak it up but I was just around music and that's all I cared about you it's know? I mean I, I'm in the same boat as you Sterling it's that same kind of feeling could you uh, touch up on, because I actually didn't realize it's already 2.30. Talking to you goes so fast. And honestly, like we talked so much in general that I, you and I talk for hours and hours. So mm -hmm. um, if you could touch up on your first professional touring experience and who it was with. Okay. Just a um, little background on that. Because there's yeah. a lot I want to, so much to talk about. Not that much time, unfortunately. Yeah. Um so things are from 81 to like 85, you know, I was playing on the scene and everything. And then one day we were playing a gig. I was playing a gig with the Pedantics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> New York City living. It's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you shut up on them, Richard Dyson? <laughs> um, this, this, a friend of mine, Kevin Jenkins, came in and said, listen, Cindy Lauper is auditioning for drummers. And so I went to the audition, but like naive, silly me, I wanted to play with Peter Gabriel and David Bowie. So I didn't, I was like, 
at the time. <laughs> sure I'm like, you know, I'm going to do that. So I do it. And then, you know, and I wasn't really caring about yeah. the, even though I never made any real money or anything like that. I just, I wasn't like, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the manager says, listen, Cindy wants you to do the gig. And I told him like, I don't, I'm not sure. And he looked at me, he just had this look on his face, like he said, and took me outside and just like kind of painted the picture. And I said, you know what, maybe you're right. <laughs> Cindy was my first gig and that was an amazing experience because I'd never been anywhere in the world and it was a world tour. You know, the first gig was at the Budokan. And- Not a bad uh, first gig. Yeah. <laughs> For the tour. And all of a sudden, you know, I mean, that's when I entered another world, you know, it's like, it was weird. I can feel the surrealness of it because it, it was so quick. And at that time, things were had a lot more reverence, like just getting a gig and being on, with a big gig was a, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing, like from our previous discussions over our friendship, I mean, from that point on, it, your career pretty much was just dominoing into each other. It was like constant mm -hmm. after that point. Um, how long were you touring with Cindy? That was like yeah, you know, almost a year. A year. And then, and then my friend Sammy Merendino asked if I would be interested in playing with Cameo. Oh wow! When they were doing the Word Up tour, mm -hmm. and uh, I did that. That didn't last long. <laughs> it was a it was a totally different vibe from Cindy. Yeah, I can imagine different. that. <laughs> um, but at the same time, the band was amazing. I mean, but it was just the vibe was different vibe. Yeah. So after that, I, you know, my longing was always to go to England, like all the stuff that I really dug that I was really, you know, since David was happy for me, it was coming out of England. So I went over there just, you know, okay, I'm going to go over there and see what's happening. And uh, I got a call, like the minute I got off the plane with this band that was just got signed, a band called So. It was yep. an amazing experience. I had such a great time. But from that, somehow, just being around the English scene, I get a call from Duran Duran. <laughs> and um, oh, yeah, man. and it was the kind of like, hey, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it was Simon LeBon, like, you know, and I met up with him and Nick Rhodes and, you know, and everything was kind of just like, it was like, a, okay, you know, it was like, that was. Well, then you became an official member. Of yeah, Duran. then like a, like a month and a half later, like, well, like a month into the tour, they made me a member of the band. And that was like a whole nother experience. I can't even imagine that. Well, what tour was that? Do you remember the year exactly? It was called the Big the Big Thing Tour. Big Thing Tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have a lot of time to go into detail with like the... <laughs> we can get a few aftermath. In. But, um, but it was, you know, it was crazy. I mean, it was crazy. It was like, a, it was, you know... It was a huge band with a huge following and like rabbit fans and well who when you were in england during that time and you had just joined duran duran where were you living in england i was in a hotel <laughs> was, I didn't even this, know that. and anybody who knows that period it was the columbia hotel right next you know it's right near hyde park and Anybody who was doing a lot of touring back in those days know that because that was the musician's hotel. And That's it was, you know, it wasn't super expensive. And when I was with So, and st you know, that was where I was staying at. Yeah. So, yeah, the phone rang one day and it was like, hi, this is Simon LeBron. And oh, my Lord. Do you have, if there's one kind of like surreal story you could tell from the touring with Duran Duran, just something, it could be goofy or you know, anything like what what was an experience that you went through where you were just like i cannot believe that happened i don't know if it's like i can i cannot believe it happened but when i when it became official i'm in the band i got called into the hotel room and it's the band looking at photos and <laughs> the band and like now i'm a fifth of this band having to make a decision on <laughs> matters of duran duran and i was just like I was just watching this on MTV in 1980, you know, watching these dudes in Sri Lanka. And all of a sudden, I think that's the closest thing to like, you know, how do I get yeah, this? Like, I'm making wait, like band decisions. Oh, um, see, that's like, yeah, you're in a room with Simon LeBon. 
going over like what but it's more funny it's not like this like oh man i made it's just like i it's, it was more of a funny thing because it's like we're no not that photo that sucks you know it's like kind of stuff like that and it's like <laughs> those are, i've seen some of those photos they're great photos i uh... I, mean, no, I mean oh god well, I, like i said it's a whole other story we can get it we want to do like a comedy version of it all like you know when I look back at it, it's just like, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a poster boy, you know. <laughs> pretty cool, man. I don't um, know. I saw those photos. I, was, I remember I called you like there's, I like had never seen them and I'd known you for years at this point. And I remember I like stumbled upon it um, when we were doing the under the influence thing for Tempt. We were looking up a bunch of stuff and out of nowhere, I just found, I you know, like looking at photos of you online, I was like, whoa, that is bad man that is a bad dude like yeah but i'm trying to tell you like the the funny thing like i was so bloody self-conscious because i'm not like a dude that would go yeah in the photo oh. i just couldn't do it and like everybody else is doing like and i'm like kind of what am i gonna do you know <laughs> so it was always like for me i always it was so uncomfortable and always felt like a deer in the headlight and it was like with these like top photographers and it was all set up and everybody's looking and I'm just like I am not this oh my so it was it was a struggle for me I, I, like, believe I hated it <laughs> oh my gosh now, I mean honestly like some of the stories I've heard I we could there's like hours and hours dedicated that we could spend on it but I'm going to try to move along a little more yeah. so I'm going to get this so, so yeah the 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 Duran came you know the 90s came and the thing with Duran ended and the 90s came yeah. And the 90s weren't the 80s. No. It was a pull, full on pull the carpet from under anybody who represented it. So, you know, um, and alternative music and then, you know, Nirvana came and, and this whole thing came and I had no idea what that was either. You know, I mean, yeah. I wasn't on my radio. I was freaking in. I was just taking the shoulder pads out of my jacket. Out of your jacket. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> like, well, what's this stuff? Hey, it's got fangs. You know, it got darker, you know? And I was like, oh, was, eh. oh, oh my man. God. So anyway, so I get a call from Soul Asylum. And Soul Asylum was an indie band and they just got their first major label deal. And they have been in the studio. They're working with uh, Michael Beinhorn, who's like, as a producer, he's, he's a taskmaster. Yeah. And they weren't, happy with what was happening with the drums mm -hmm. at that time and um and you know i i felt bad I, I really didn't want to you know the you know the idea of coming in to do a record to, to like replace somebody's parts it was uncomfortable because yeah. he was there and you know whatever like so okay so um, it's like indie band drummer it's an alternative thing and uh <clears throat> i just winged it like i pretty much did Pretty much everything. I just kind of wing it and see if you know. There's always a little sense. I don't say, it, but it's always like, is this like this? You know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that record turned out to be very successful. Yeah, and so like four million copies. You know, it. You know. Yeah, and you were classic. Proud. Got some classic stuff on there. Runaway and, um, Train, which very you, you know very proud of that because like, yeah. I was just like I said, I was winging it. Well, and then you joined, you were asked to join the band. Well, that came later. Yeah, because you were on that first record, on that first record, that was a no-no to bring in an outside, like a technically, I'm, I never consider myself a studio player, but technically yeah. I was a studio player. So well, they so even I asked me when on the credits, hey, is it okay if we put you down as percussion? And, um, you know, I mean, I got it. I was like, well, you know, yeah, all right. Pretty surreal. Oh, my God. Right. You know, I'll, I'm the percussionist. And, but anyway, so I went on to another tour with a, a Swiss artist for a year or two, and then I get a call. No, sorry. After that, I get a call because I became really good friends with Nile Rogers. Yep. And I get a call about Nile calling me up, asking me if like I would be interested in doing the David Bowie record, <sighs> Black Tie, White Noise. And, there we um, go. Full hmm, let me see. Um, conversation. Let me see about this. David Bowie, that's the guy with the, 
Yeah, wait, I think I know him. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I'm in the studio with David Bowie. I walk in, smiles. Hey, how's it going, man? You know, I'm glad you I'm glad you can do the record and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm glad you can like whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was, but you know, by that point, I wasn't. I felt like I did all the homework and I prepped it, like Duran prepped me. Yeah. Doing all that stuff in the early 80s. Because after like the early 80s, especially with the post-punk and all the synth pop and all that stuff, there is such a taste of David Bowie and all that stuff. So I have, you know, after that 78 tour, I was already like David Bowie, blah, 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 blah. You know, I went like incrementally, like what every song was doing and blah, 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 blah. You know, so you know, by the time I got to David, I felt prepped. So I, I you know, you were so ready. He threw, he threw songs at me, and you know, and a lot of it was just like, there's, n I mean, the feeling of like you're on the headphones and you hear the talk back. Great, man, that was great. Oh my god, <laughs> that's so awesome. That's probably my favorite thing, you know, because that's like Stanley Kubrick, like going, great take. Yeah, and it's like that's wow. great. So you, after you did that record with Bowie, were you, that's when you joined Soul Asylum? Then Soul Asylum was doing another record with Butch Vig. Yeah. And they asked me to do that record. And then I think the, the drummer left the band. Yep. And um, they asked me to join the band. So cool. now I'm in, I'm like burning the shoulder pads. <laughs> Taking out the flag. I was I was actually over it anyway a long time ago. It's like yeah. I don't want to. I, mean, I, I don't want to be a rock star. I want to be. Um, I want to make music and be music. It's a rock star thing. Like so, even when I joined the band, I was like, I even asked him if it was possible not to be in the photos. That's how I like, messed up I was from it all. Yeah, which is funny enough because you ended up being on the cover of Rolling Stone with yeah. the band. Yeah. How wild was that? Like, <laughs> well, the the cover you see is not even the original cover. We did yeah. this cover with this another photographer, and the cover was us inside this hotel room, and they did some kind of where like the the walls were blown out. Yeah. And you can see the skyline. But what happened in nineteen? I think it was I, I forgot what ninety four or ninety whenever the the first the first uh, World Trade bombing. Yeah. Not the one that knocked the buildings down, but the first one, there was a big bombing. And because of that, it was during that time. So we had to change the front cover and they came up with this weird buttoned. Uh, if you look at the cover, it's just bizarre. Okay, you know. Yeah, here we go. Oh mm, my strange God. cover. So and that was a crazy time too, because when we did the interview for it, we had just finished doing the record and we we had to play South by Southwest and the night before we got completely wasted. Oh. And the guy based his, uh, our whole interview. We were just kind of winding down from it. Yeah. And the dude based his whole, the whole interview from our night of just kind of drinking. Oh. It was not great. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Honestly, Sterling, it's funny, like going through all this and looking at some of the names that you've played with and like, I mean, to be a musician and to tour with one of these acts is a career in its own. And it's like pretty, there's, there's a story I want you to tell about, or I'll never forget you telling me about David being unimpressed with a decision you had made about going on another run with another act. Do you remember what I'm talking about? No, but I probably wouldn't want to talk about it. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll cut that out, I'm sorry. Anything you don't want to talk about, I will make sure. <laughs> I, just, I remember I found it pretty funny. Um, all right, let's get to- How much time you we have? Uh, not much, it's only like 15 minutes left. I'm like trying to- Okay. It's so hard to, uh, as well, a- I always also want to say that year, the same year, working with Nile, he brought me on a couple of other projects because I got to work, I was very fortunate to work with both Nile and Bernard. I mean, they were like big brothers to me. So they they had me do a chic record. I don't know if it was the same year, but they also introduced me to the B-52s, who Zach played yeah. with before. 
and who another high school friend of mine, Charlie Drayton, who I used to hang out with all the time in school. I mean, he was already in high school playing with like Shaka Khan and, and David Sample. I mean, Charlie Drayton, it was, that was the first time I ever seen a Walkman. He came back from Japan with a Walkman. I was like, yeah, that was amazing. So there's, 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 there's been this really cool, like with the B-52s, Charlie, Zach and myself and Scooter, uh, I don't know if you know Scooter Warner, another great drummer who lives in New Orleans now. Oh, wow. Um, this has been an amazing, uh, uh, my friend Tony James, who I went to high school with, played with Cindy. So they did, my friend Larry Aberman, who I went to high school with, played with Nile. I mean, it's just like incredible, like this, the, all these people I went to school and I grew up with. Yeah, just, it's, it's all connected. Yeah. So what year, um, cause, Sorry, I'm trying, I'm getting a little- I think, I'm not sure, like the, the 92 was David, my first year with David yeah. and the B-52. And I think Sheik, it's called Sheikism. I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I'm not very good with time, but it was- Sounds like a good year. Well, yeah, I mean, and hanging out with Nile and hanging out with Bernard, these dudes were like- I would have loved to be a fly on the wall during I mean, that. I'm gonna talk about like, you, you say producers, man, those guys, man it's it's absolutely incredible and you so you played with bowie from 92 93, 92, 93 till i mean the last record i did and and then like i i did outside with him and that was with brian you know yeah and then zach came in to do uh the outside tour and then he did earthling and then I came back for this album, uh, Hours, mm -hmm. then Part of Heathen, then Reality, and then, um, what was it, The Next Day? It's, I mean, it's such a, like, what was it like being friends and being around people like David Bowie and Brian Eno? Like, what, what was, if you could, like, sum them up, in your eyes and how your friendship was and how he was as a person. Because I know how I see him. Like I'm, I'm a huge Bowie fan and I, like, he's like a superhero to me. Mm -hmm. and I, I think the most important, the, the, for me, the secret was comedy. Yeah. Everything, I mean, I, if I had to say the amount of time I spent with David, I would say 85% of it was just comedy, laughing. Oh my gosh. The making of outside was like so much fun and we were just laughing a lot and just just cracking each other up. It's so incredible. The boring with David was like that. He's so funny. So oh. funny and so like I mean if you saw that bit what he does on extras that Oh yes. I mean it was like that. Oh that's so funny. It's like that. That's why he's so funny because he really is funny. And he turned me on to the office with Ricky Gervais. That we did an album where when we were cutting the, the basics, basically we would start and then have lunch and watch The Office. He already had a copy of it. This was 2002, 2003. So it was already big in England, but it wasn't known here. And, we, and he had VHSs of it and we would watch it. And yeah. it's, I couldn't even, I was bringing that into the studio where I couldn't even count the song off because I was just thinking about what transpired. Oh my lord! We'd have to say, I was like, let's start over. I was like, one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like laughing, thinking of him. Oh my gosh! So currently, you are in. Are you? You're touring with the B fifty twos. I'm touring with the B fifty twos, but we haven't played for a while, and there's a weird phenomenon happening because it's been like two months since I picked up a drumstick, and I started noticing something. What happened? There's grass growing on the sticks. Oh no! Sterling! What? <laughs> you gotta trim your hedges. <laughs> oh jeez. Grass growing on my drumstick. Did you, did you really do that? <laughs> I'm sure you killed it, man. <laughs> yeah, I had to have a prop. <laughs> oh my god. 
making things like started. my one prop. <laughs> my one prop. What I love is that you you saved it. You've been saving that for this yeah. moment. I was so, waiting for the moment. Just the moment to go. Um, all right, we, we're shorter on time, but I do. We've got 10 minutes. I can I tell know. you like the last bit of my life in 10 minutes. Well, I want to talk about the fact that you had my gig. You, you know, what was it like recording with my band <laughs> before I was even a freaking member, man? Um, I recognized, I mean, you know, it was Harrison and Zach, and I was like, it was pretty potent. I was like, wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, and I got asked to do it, and it was a lot of fun. And we went up to this amazing studio in Vermont. Guilford Sound, right? Yeah. Oh, man, that place. I don't even know if it's... I, it's, I wonder if it's still happening. Oh, it's still happening. It's an I amazing studio. One of the most amazing studios I've ever been in. And we just had a great time. We had, like, two days, and it was, like, in the middle of winter in Vermont. Huge glass windows. It's all snow outside. We go... Yeah, I, I took my famous snow walk into the woods. Yeah, they the everyone talking about your snow walk after the takes. Yeah, it's crazy. Like a lot of you know, I mean, that stuff was recorded. Was it 2012? Like the record was done a lot earlier before it actually came out, and before I was even a member of the band. Um, it's just it's pretty surreal how full circle everything comes. Yeah, and then uh, me getting the gig. There was drummers before me and after you. It's just, it's crazy, man. It's absolutely crazy. And now we've got a worldwide epidemic and grass growing on drumsticks. I know. How are what we supposed to going play? on? You know, it's funny. I, for most of this pandemic, I haven't had drumsticks. And I, I like needed them. And I was like, I finally, you know, I ordered them like a few days after I retreated from New York City. And it took like a month for them to get here and I held them and it was like holding logs. They were, so, they felt so big in my hands. Like mm -hmm. it was so surreal. And I miss it absolutely terribly. Um, well, I had to you... go to the studio the other day, pick up some, you know, I wanted to bring some gear home and I played yeah. once for the first time. And it was like this, why is this now deemed yeah. weird? I got the video. I got yeah. that video. Freaking deemed weird. I, this is weird. I'm playing drums that like, what? No, it's, it's a pretty crazy time, man. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. I want to kind of go back in the chat and just briefly look at some questions. Um, what do we got here? Uh, Kim asks, what is your favorite Bowie album? As a listener, what is your favorite Bowie album? Mm. That's tough. I would probably say Heroes. Heroes? Mm -hmm. I think that's a perfectly fine answer. Uh, we got a great question from Tag. What's the what's the best pizza on the Upper West Side? Sal and Carmine's. There we go. Sal <laughs> and Carmine's, and it's open till ten o'clock. So good. Day. Have you had it recently? Are they still open? They're open till yeah. ten now. Yeah. Well, that works out. I mean, when I saw that they were open, I was like, "There's hope." It's comfort food, man. I remember having oh. it for the first time. Our good friend Tag sitting me down and being like, this is the best pizza you'll ever have, I promise. Oh, on, it's pretty damn good. Um, let's see what else we got here. That's great, Sterling, if you sit in on it. Okay, Leslie asks, that's, you may have trouble with some of the names, but um, Sterling, if you sit in on a temp jam session, which you have actually, which song is a must to play for you? A uh, temp song? Yeah. There's a lot there. You've heard a lot. But you've heard all the demos and all the new stuff, and there's like a list of songs. Yeah, I can't. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, it's funny because I just have still have fond memories from doing that record because it was it was weird. It was a it was a one off thing, but it was really special because the studio was great, and we had a really good time, and it was great watching. Harrison and Zach just, you know, like you're, you're watching their thing unfold. Yeah. You know, um, so it's not really one thing. I was just like, just kind of being around, being around the thing and just, and it's fun to watch somebody like kind of, 
it's just like when I was growing up, it was fun to go see bands. Like you would see bands go from CBGBs to stadiums. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how the police started. They started at CBGBs and then went to the next level. And then the next thing you know, they're playing this, in that Shea Stadium. I saw them at Shea Stadium. It doesn't that's exist normal. anymore. The synchronicity tour. I when the first time you show watch up, a band like I I love that watching a band mature. So yeah. oh we can talk for hours. You know, I just realized we need to get into some drumming influences, but like there's not enough time, man. But I know Copeland is important. You've really I mean I was always a fan of Copeland, but you really opened up my uh my imagination and how wonderful Stuart Copeland and as like as a drummer and musician is he's incredible. Mm -hmm. The police are bad, man. Some bad players. Stevie Wonder is one of my favorite drums. Oh, yeah. Stevie Wonder and Dennis and Steve Jordan. Yep. Well, I, I love my friends drumming. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, I had a lot to feed off of. What about my you know, drumming? You, oh, you like my drumming? I love your drumming. You know I do. I tell you all the time. <laughs> no. I had to tell you on Zoom, you needed me to freaking tell. I do. I do. I like tried to play. I mean, I was going through like rudiments the other day and I'm like. Everyone like PSA, Nick's a bad drama. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Lord. All right. Well. And bad means good. It does. <laughs> Sterling taught me that. <laughs> bad means good. He's a bad dude. All right, Sterling. Well. I enjoyed talking to you. I hope everyone else enjoyed this brief conversation. It's, you know, it's been, an, it was a fast hour. I like, can't believe that. Um, you know, I, I hope to see you soon. I know I'll be talking to you soon because yeah. we talk a lot. Um, I hope to be Zooming you soon. I'm going to Zoom you. <laughs> we'll be Zooming plenty. I'm going to have to do the Zoom, 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 and the boom, boom. <laughs> zoom, Zoom, Boom, Boom. <laughs> All right, man. Well, well, be well. I'll all best to you. everyone. Everybody hang in there. Yeah. That's I don't know what to tell you, but <laughs> we're all in the I same boat. Sterling's got moss growing on his drumsticks. That's it. It's mad. <laughs> it's madness. All right. Well, Sterling, thank you so much. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it plenty. And, um, you know, it's been so good to talk to you. Now I'm gonna go sanitize my hands. Yep, wash your hands, Sterling. All right. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much. Hope you all have a good time. Uh, we're Thank logging you. off. This is it. <laughs>